Like a backstage pass to the world of fly fishing travel, this is Waypoints, the podcast of destination angling. News and events, helpful travel tips, destination profiles, great stories, and expert advice from some of the most seasoned and experienced names in fishing travel. Waypoints is brought to you by Yellow Dog Fly Fishing Adventures, the industry's number one specialty travel company for the very best insider knowledge, logistical support, and trip preparation. Freshwater or saltwater, international or domestic, Yellow Dog has you covered for your next fishing adventure. And now, your Waypoints host, Yellow Dog founder and director, Jim Klug. In our continuing series of gear and tech episodes dedicated to equipment for the traveling angler, we are talking today with Peter Knox of Sage. As a company, Sage has been in business since 1980. The company was founded by Don Green on Bainbridge Island, Washington, with the goal of creating high-performance fly rods using innovative materials and technologies. Sage revolutionized the fly fishing world as an early champion of the application of graphite materials in rod manufacturing, and today, 45 years later, Sage has firmly established their position as one of the most respected brands in the entire fishing industry. Peter Knox is the lead fly rod designer at Sage. Based out of the company's headquarters on Bainbridge Island, Peter has played a significant role in developing some of Sage's most advanced rod technologies, including the recently introduced R8 Core and Salt R8 Series. Known for his expertise in rod engineering, Knox actually grew up near Sage's headquarters and developed a passion for fly fishing at a young age that eventually led him into the industry. Since joining the Sage team, Peter has been instrumental in pushing the boundaries of rod design, focusing on both performance and user experience. Peter, welcome to Waypoints. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Jim. It's good to have you here in Bozeman. Appreciate uh, you spending time out here with us and joining us in the studio to talk about uh, fly rods for the traveling angler and rod technology in general. Yeah, you bet. It's been a, a fun day already. Um, I, love, I love kicking around the shop. You know, there's always like in every shop, there's something new that i haven't seen before so yeah it, it's inspirational to well, see you know new products or or what everybody else is doing just the enthusiasm of the staff and everything so well, good well i know i know they love it when uh, when you guys show up from the factory and spend some time here so that's great how uh, how's the rod business how are things at sage these days uh i'm enjoying a little bit of like stability covid was like um you know, there's a lot of good business happening, um, but also on the back end, um, like relating to supply chain and, and, you know, we work with some small vendors, manufacturers, um, the fly fishing industry is pretty small overall. And so there was like just that big wrinkle and an influx of, of sales and demand, and then it tapered off and, you know, there's the whole like inventory game. And, and then some of those um, players that support us have gone through turbulence. And so now it's we're just getting to the point where it's like starting to even back out. We've got like a, a laminar flow on on all our stuff. So that feels good. Calmer waters. Yeah, these days. yeah exactly. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, give us some background on sage rods. I mean, there's few people in, in fly fishing, few anglers out there that aren't familiar with the Sage brand. I mean, it's a powerhouse brand, but give us a little bit of background on the company, a little history of Sage. Yeah, you touched on it with uh, Don Green. Uh, you know, he'd spent um, years designing rods. He was involved with um, Fenwick, for example, um, and even, well, prior to that, manufacturing his own blanks. Um, and he started Sage about the same time that graphite was becoming available for, you know, recreational equipment. And, uh, and, and so he combined that material with sort of the user experience side of things um, and, and kind of coined the fast action rod, which became, I think, almost synonymous with Sage over the years. Um, and so that was really the start of Sage, and, and it's evolved over time. Um, you know, we've had Jerry Seam is, is another guy who's been, you know, involved in designing rods for Sage, and, and those two are, well, they're just like legends in my mind, you know. So um, here we are, and I guess this is the next chapter. 45 years after Don first started the company. Yeah, it's incredible. It's pretty amazing. Well, how about your background, Peter? Tell us kind of your story and how you found your way into fly fishing as a sport and eventually, you know, into the industry as a career. Yeah, sure. Uh, when I was growing up, my dad took me fishing, and, and we did a lot of outdoors stuff. Um, but he, he mostly fished um, conventional tackle and um, 
I love that. But also I think I was like trying to do my own thing, you know? So I thought I was like a little bit edgy or something and thought I'd like pick up a fly rod. Um, and so, uh, I did that like in my early teens and kind of taught myself how to cast, spent a lot of time on the grass, you know, flinging a torn up line. Um, and then I, I worked in the local fly shop a little bit, like on weekends. Um, and as a kid, I, I really wanted to be a fishing guide, uh, until I did it. And then I, until <laughs> I realized like, there's so much more than just like going and catching a fish. Yeah. Um, and so I, I just tried a little bit of guiding. Um, but you know, it, I think lean back on my abilities to, I mean, I've always been good with, uh, uh, create creative efforts and then kind of the math science, uh, engineering side. So I got a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, and in the middle of that, I, uh, I scored a summer job at Sage rolling blanks. Uh, and so I, I did that and that was really my foot in the door. I spent, um, several summers, uh, after that interning for the product development group. Uh, and, and then I even rolled that into, uh, as I was taking classes, I'd clear my schedule one day a week and go over to Sage. I was going to the University of Washington, so it was like a couple hour commute. Uh, and then that kind of held my spot until I was able to work full time. And I've been designing rods full time for 10 plus years. That's pretty cool. I mean, you basically started as a, a summer intern and all these years later, you're now the lead rod designer for the company. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, it doesn't, uh, doesn't feel real, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of like right, a, a what, story what right from the mailroom to running yeah. the company. That's yeah, pretty right. impressive. Yeah. Well, when people travel to fish, Peter, we know that they typically spend a good deal of money on the actual trip package, on their flights, all the related costs of getting to a destination. And of course, they buy gear, and especially yeah. if it's kind of a new or exotic destination. For many anglers, I, I would even venture to say that buying the new gear and making sure they have the latest toys and you know, stuff in the fly box with new patterns. That's kind of part of the overall travel experience, Absolutely. part of the adventure experience. What advice do you have for someone that's in the market right now for new travel rods? Let's say they're jumping into the world of destination saltwater angling, or they're headed down to the jungle for the first time, and they want to kit themselves out, uh, you know, whether it's freshwater or saltwater, what do I need to know if I'm a person who walks into a fly shop I have no idea of what I'm looking for. I walk to the back of the shop and there's a whole wall of different brands and different rods out there. Um, give us some advice on, on how to start that process. Yeah, I think, um, well, hopefully the fly shop has expertise to, you know, um, point you in the right direction as far as line weight goes um, and, and application. You know, if you're going bone fishing, maybe there's some permit. Hey, you might want to consider two rods or maybe a nine weight could do it all or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I'd suggest that, um, well, I'd say try the rods out if you can see what appeals to you. Um, and then spend some time with the rod, like practicing it, It's so huge. Um, but every time I come away from a, a trip that's had challenging fishing, basically every trip, I tell myself like, I need to like be better at casting. And it's, um, you know, it's just like a, it's your, you can always improve at that and it can always up your game and. And so, yeah, I'd say spend some good time uh, picking out the rod and then spend some time working with the rod and, and getting comfortable with it because when the pressure's on and the fish is there, you know, you get the buck fever, what have you. It's never as easy when you're on the front of that skiff. That's right. But I think you nail it. You got to be familiar with your tools, right? You yeah. got to almost make it second nature. And, and uh, it's so funny, no matter how, you know what the subject of these episodes are, whether we're talking with you know, guides or lodge owners or fisheries biologists or manufacturers, uh, everyone shares that same piece of advice. It's like practice, just yeah, get out absolutely. and practice before you go. It's so key. And it doesn't even matter how good you are or, or how many years you've been doing it. That practice is always going to help. It's a common theme on, on this, uh, this podcast. Absolutely. For sure. Well, let's get back to some specific questions about sage rods. Now, full disclosure, we sell sage here at Yellow Dog. In fact, we sell a lot of sage rods. Uh, and of course, you know, we sell most of the other leading brands and established rod companies as well. But there is no doubt that sage is certainly considered one of the top brands out there. And, and sage has, has been a leader in the industry, as we talked about, for you know 45 years since Don first started the company. Um, you know, you guys have, have really kind of led the way on pioneering new technologies, developing proprietary materials, 
uh, introducing what I would call a pretty broad range of all types of rods for all different applications. Um, you know, you guys really, in that 45-year run, managed to, to stay on top in what is a really competitive industry. What do you attribute that to, that, that success and that ongoing success? Yeah, I think um, when we talk about uh, rod design and, uh, and, you know, rod development within our small group at Sage, we talk about it as a, a combination of art and science. And so we're doing a lot of, you know, re, uh, we're doing a lot of scientific work. We're doing mechanical testing. We're being really thoughtful about how we're proving out uh, the performance of some of our materials and constructions and some of our components uh, from a you know quantitative level. But at some point, it's got to go to the art side of things. And, and that is huge crafting a feel for the rod knowing the application of what the rod has to do uh how it should feel and and even creating a personality for the rod and so i think we over the years have had a really nice combination of art and science and we and and those two things together have made for some awesome products it's worked yeah it definitely has well i'm guessing that most anglers uh certainly most listeners of this episode have never set foot in a fly rod factory before. Mm -hmm. um, kind of describe that to us. I mean, is it, you know, super futuristic and techie or is it, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a laid back, uh, easy going place? Uh, kind of describe Sage's headquarters to us. Yeah, what I hear from people um, when I give them a tour and they haven't seen the factory before is um, they say, well, everything's handcrafted. There's so many people here. And I think there's a lot of expectation that uh, everything's like automated and super futuristic, maybe. Um, but there's a lot of craftsmanship that goes into even rolling a blank. There's a lot of technique there. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately, the processes haven't changed a ton over the last 40 years, 40 plus years. Um, however, uh, there's like the devils in the details with that stuff. It very small things that are probably not apparent to most people um, are, make the difference in, you know, that plus or minus some level of, of, uh, of performance. Well, are all of your rods that, that Sage offers, do you make them there in the factory? On we Bainbridge? do, yeah. They're all, like, right on the other side of the wall from my desk. All it's cool. US I can made. walk out there, yeah, and yeah. talk to whoever and, and try stuff out, you know? Yeah. Well, we, we've seen a huge influx uh, of rods into the industry that are built overseas a lot of them coming from from asia mm -hmm. um, different countries over there you know when it comes to domestic rod production you know even some of the big names some of the expensive names are now importing but you guys have kept that focus of building everything in the states right there in the factory yeah i you know, I think you um, could potentially have a good factory anywhere in the world, but you know where we're situated gives us um, some a leg up. When we talk to material suppliers, there's a lot of uh, composite stuff going on in in the on the West Coast and in the Pacific Northwest, and so we're able to like drive to um, potential vendors that sort of thing. So that's nice. Um, but we've had our factory in the same spot for years and years and years. We've had, we have employees that have been with the company for 30 plus years. And so, um, I mean, it would, it would be a tough thing to walk away from, right? Is, is all that expertise and knowledge, um, just within our manufacturing side. Well, we also have a number of, I would call them newer rod companies that have hit the scene, say over the past five years or so that have launched as direct to consumer brands. And, you know, we see yeah, this sure. in the hunting industry as well. We certainly see it in the apparel industry. Uh, you know, a lot of these new brands seem to focus most of their marketing and kind of sales efforts through Instagram and social media. And they're all promising, you know, premium performance, but at a highly discounted price. Uh, it's kind of an interesting deal because there's a lot of them out there. Are you seeing any of these new entities gaining traction or is there anything that you're you guys are paying attention to or is like now nah, that's kind of you know import noise that is big on you know instagram this month and that company will probably go away in the not too distant future yeah i don't think we really view them as direct competitors i think just the level of like noise though is maybe uh the commentary is just like there's way more noise right um 
if there's like a hundred new little guy players, maybe you argue that they like all add up to a big player in some fashion, right? But no, I I wouldn't say that like any specific name is really pops up in in conversation. Yeah, we see a, a correlation in the travel world, right? You know, a lot of oh, yeah. little tiny kind of hobbyist agents or entities that um, alone, you know, it's just, you know, they're kind of insignificant, but, you know, they kind of collectively do add up a little bit and then it creates that noise. You're absolutely right. That's a great way to describe it. Yeah, I think it's getting easier uh, for people to do uh, whatever they want in the world. You know, technology and all that is enabling small players to, you know, exist and maybe thrive in some instances. Well, let me ask you about quality of product. So mm-hmm. let's say someone is spending $1,000 on a new Sage R8 rod, for example. Uh, another option is there's a rod that's built in Korea or China, and it retails for half the amount. And, you know, they both look okay. You know, they've both got great advertising campaigns. Everybody's getting pretty savvy on that, even the, the little players. Explain the difference that people are going to um, have when they pick up both of those rods, uh, an R8 that's a thousand dollar rod and something that's, you know, $400 off of Instagram from a upstart company. Yeah. I think, uh, um, a lot of, uh, well, at least some of what people are paying for is the intellectual property that goes into, uh, that design. And so, uh, we spend a lot of time on the water with experts, um, with guides and, and anglers and, and some of us may be considered, uh, subject experts. Uh, and so we're trying to craft, uh, rods to certain applications. So that's one element. I think, uh, just premium materials is a huge one. We've, uh, going back to the intellectual property, we have done a ton of testing of our materials. So we're not just hitting up the sporting good material supplier and saying, give me X, Y, Z off the shelf. We're getting custom materials. We have, uh, our own resin formulation that, We've developed over the years with independent chemists, um, and we we have that material uh, cr- made for us, and then in graphite fibers uh, combined with that in a way that is totally unique. Uh, so there's an element of um, intellectual property into the materials, and then I'd just say uh, you know craftsmanship. We're very thoughtful about what we want the rod to to perform like. We, um, most of us are anglers and so we can uh qualify you know we we qualify what we're looking for some stuff made overseas is made by somebody who's never casted a trout before and i think there's some level of um uh like security and in knowing that that rod was made by somebody who knows the ultimate uh usage and can tell you whether it's a good one or a bad one Well, and and I would guess you guys also probably have a lot of costs having to do with research and development. I mean, every ride you make probably doesn't go all the way to becoming a new series. You guys are probably continuously creating things, playing around with it, and then tweaking it and, and, you know, trying to really hone it into something that you're then excited to bring to market. There's definitely some of that black box type stuff. But also, uh, like you said, just um, it seems sometimes like uh, endless refinement. You know, it's not like give me this one and tweak this. It's like sometimes it's tough to put the final stamp on the product because it's like I always want to make it like a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And at some point, it's got to be a thing. It's got to be done. But, um, yeah, we're really enthusiastic about just creating awesome product. Well, let's ask some specific questions about actually building fly rods. And I'll start with some basic questions, all right? Um, I know, again, we've got some listeners that probably – haven't thought a lot about rod construction and design and how, you know, they're actually created from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. But uh, first talk to us about how the material used in a rod, you know, whether it's high modulus graphite or back in the day, fiberglass, you know, back way back in the day, bamboo. Um, How do these materials, you know, directly influence the performance of a rod? So I think over time, uh, if you look at the development of materials, you know, we've been, in it trending towards um lighter weight stronger um higher line speed there are a lot of good qualities that come from you know newer materials today and so we can uh select materials depending on any one of these qualities that we want to tease out in a rod um and the the newest materials are just so potent it's it's 
awesome to work with them. Um, but we're looking at different things. You mentioned fibers, absolutely. Um, resins are huge, right? Fiber and resin are the two components that go into a fly rod blank. Um, but then within that, we can um, we can tailor the ratios of fibers and re resins to tease out different qualities. We can place fibers at different angles. Uh, so you may have heard of like hoop fibers. Those run at 90 degrees to the axis of the blank, and they um, can provide a, a structure for the blank and, and a lot of strength. Um, and then, you know, a lot of fibers run down the length of the blank, and those are like uh, ropes. You know, when you bend that blank, those fibers are getting pulled in tension. Uh, and then in some cases, we may even like bias fibers and, and get a little bit of each of those. And so anyhow, these are all different levers that we can pull um, in addition to just like what's the modulus of the fiber or um, or that sort of thing. So there's uh, uh, seems to me there's an endless number of possibilities for where it can go. And uh, and that's part of the fun is exploring all of those. Well, when. We talk about the action of a fly rod. And, you know, if you mm. are a consumer and you walk into a fly shop and, you know, the, the guy working in the shop says, oh, boy, you know, the action on this rod or the action on this rod, what are they referring to? Yeah, that's, uh, it, it, you know, put in a really short form that's where the rod bends and, and how it recovers, too. Yeah, that makes sense, how it loads, how it recovers. Yep. Well, sage has largely been known, and you touched on this already a couple times, but for producing fairly fast action rods, certainly for the, you know, especially like the past 20 years, really mm -hmm. fast rods. What are your thoughts on different applications for different actions? For example, do slow action or kind of the old school medium action rods still serve a purpose these days or have all of the developments and innovations and new composites uh, that have come out of, have, you know, you combine those with the new fly line technologies, you know, more aggressive tapers on fly lines, all of these things, ha has all of this collectively kind of negated uh, the purpose of anything that isn't kind of fast and stiff these days? Is that just where the rod world is? Or, you know, are there any applications for kind of the, the slower or medium action rods? You know, I think there's a little bit of a trend back away from the fast action sort of thing. And, and that's always in my mind is what's the overall trend of where things are going. As I'm a, developing a new rod, it's kind of like, let's look out a few years um, and the fly fishing world is always changing ever so slightly. Like you said, lines are getting a little bit different. Maybe they're getting heavier or, you know, maybe the way people are fishing is a little bit different. Trout streamers are getting bigger. Tarpon bugs are getting smaller. All of that comes into uh, play when I think about, you know, a new fly rod. And so, yeah, medium action rod um, definitely has some applications. I think casting short. Um, and just personal preference as well. I think at the end of the day, a lot of trout fishing doesn't require like uh, the ultimate in like casting or presentation and we're out there to have fun. So why not pick up a rod that makes you happy? Yeah. Well, there's a pretty cool write up that I, I found on Sage's website um, that talks about how in the early years of the company, Don Green, founder Don Green, uh, believe that fly rods should never run out of power. And yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. And and his philosophy was that the best rod designs should be those that always held power in reserve. And when you think about just the mechanics of the stroke and casting, it makes a lot of sense. But uh, it, the website goes on to talk about how the name reserve power was given to this new style of, of rods that Don was developing and that he was focusing on high line speed for, you know, extra long casts and also fishing in windy conditions, challenging conditions. Reserve power was then abbreviated to the RP designation, which was Sage's first major fly rod series. That kind of changed everything for, for fly rods. I mean, for casting and for fishing applications, that concept of reserve power. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, talking to Don years later, uh, I think the the reserve power and and high line speed and and all of that verbiage uh, boils down to having control over the fly at all distances. But that to me, control is the one word that's the through thread in all of it. Is is us tr creating rods that better help anglers control their cast, control their fly, um, and make a presentation that's as best as it can be. 
Well, that's that's well said. I like that. Um, tell us a little bit about the newer Sage Rods, the R8 series, uh, the Salt series. This is kind of your baby that, yeah. that you came out with, and I'm sure you're already working on, on the next thing. But let's talk about the current um, R8 rods that are out there. Tell us a little bit about that project and, and how you went about designing that. Yeah, the R8 technology itself is um, an application of some new fibers that hit the market several years ago. And these fibers are the real deal. They're really the next generation of graphite fibers that are being used in a variety of applications, not just you know fly fishing, sporting goods, that sort of thing. And these fibers in general, they um, add a level of durability to high modulus. It's really interesting. So our R8 fibers uh, have a, a roughed up surface, like on a, a microscopic level. It's like if you're painting your boat or something and you want to put on the next layer, you, you hit it with some sandpaper, right? And then you apply your next layer of paint or epoxy, what have you. Um, and so same thing goes for these fibers. They're just super tied into the resin on a chemical level. And it makes for like super strong blanks that really like to go through a bend. But then they have that like high modulus recovery and line speed to them. That's just it's awesome. And so in application, we can take uh, that material quality. And, and so for me, designing a rod, I can either substitute that strength and durability right into a rod and you can see that like in our salt r8 series of saltwater rods where it's really important to have that strength and durability whether it's for just lifting a fish or like i'm going to mexico and no repair service is going to help me in three days or whatever uh and so that's one application the other would be in our r8 core for freshwater rods where we we were looking for something really lightweight and responsive. I can use less material and uh, and get to um, the same ultimate strength because the material itself is stronger, and that makes for just an awesome uh, lightweight blank that that has awesome sensation and and line speed and recovery. Well, when you're designing rods, let me ask you this: How does rod length affect casting distance and accuracy? And and you know, for years, the, you know, the nine foot rod has been kind of the staple, um, you know, for some rods, they go up to nine and a half or 10. We've seen uh, a lot of saltwater rods in the past at like an eight foot, eight inch. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about how just a couple inches can, can make a difference as far as distance and accuracy. Yeah, I think um, a longer rod, of course, helps cast further. You've got a longer lever going on there. Um, I think they can cast some heavier lines too, a little bit easier probably. Uh, and so you see longer rods favored in like in the UK for stillwater fishing, uh, because they're trying to cast really far often, or they have really long leaders. Uh, and so a long rod can help uh, at distance. And then conversely, a short rod has just awesome accuracy. I love fishing like an eight and a half foot rod for trout. Uh, in some cases, that feels like the ultimate in performance. And so some of the shorter rod, uh, saltwater rods are intriguing, but I also think that there's a reason we've kind of settled at nine feet. It's a pretty nice spot. You could be plus or minus three inches, you know, and, and uh, like an eight, nine is an awesome length. Still much shorter than that. And you start to, um, I think you start to lose a little bit of that, that distance game. Uh, and, and also the, the fly uh, can get quite close to your, like body, like physically, you know, and I think that's great if you're like a really good caster. But if that fly has a, you know, if it's flying past you at like a different distance away from your body every time, it's like, I don't want to take my chances with anything too short. Yeah, every single guide in the world that rows a drift boat is like, please bring a longer rod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when you're casting over my head, <laughs> use the long one. Well, we know that action and rod flex obviously play a huge role in how a rod casts. Um, and this is a big part of the design process, going out just casting and casting and casting. But talk to us about how these characteristics, the action, the flex, translate to actually fighting and landing fish, which, you know, it's possible to have a great casting rod, but then applications to make it, you know, the ideal fishing tool. Talk to us about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the the pulling ability of a rod really comes into play when you get to maybe 10 weight, 
you know, below that, um, you can typically, I think, pull a fish in um, using most any rod. I think technique comes into play a lot there. But at some point, if you're fishing for large fish and especially out of a boat, some of the rod angles um, just necessitate um, a, a rod that has some level of like fish fight as as the, a, a requisite quality, right? It can't just be a casting rod. It's got to have some fish fighting ability. Um, and so, of course, that requires some power down low in the rod. And uh, I think th that is part of the challenge as a designer is creating a rod that's easy for people to cast, but then also um, allows really good casters to cast a distance and then pull on fish and and making a rod that does everything is is a good challenge it's got to be fun to you know try to combine all those elements into that finished product yeah oftentimes like everything's kind of um held in tension a little bit like i want this thing this quality over here but then i want you know the fish fighting quality over here and it's kind of like okay i'm good enough with both these two things okay like this is a good rod you know that makes sense well Another question that, that I think listeners might have is that, you know, 30 years ago, pretty much every high-end rod that you could purchase in the industry was a two-piece rod, right? Yeah. That was kind of the standard. That then transitioned for like a 10-year period where the new thing was like a, a three-piece rod, right? It was getting, yeah. getting shorter. And it was always about the, the ferrules, right? The, the connection of the pieces. Now, it seems like almost every single rod that's sold is a four-piece rod. Uh, how do the number of rod sections, you know, the two versus three versus four directly impact performance and, and have new kind of feral technologies and designs really kind of allowed these four piece rods today to, you know, hit that sweet spot. Are they, you know, as a four piece rod today casting just as well as a two piece rod did back in the day? Yeah. It, ferals are so good. Now we've spent a lot of time developing new feral materials and, and just making them really slim. You, you made, no, like recognize that back in the day there was often a ferrule reinforcement that was just like a big lump r right there right right in the middle of the rod you had this like lump of graphite uh and now we've we've dropped that profile so we're using uh, just as much material as is necessary to get the job done to reinforce that ferrule um and so yeah a, a four-piece rod feels awesome these days uh and actually the more sections that there are in a rod for me as a, a designer that allows me to use so many more materials and optimize down the length of the rod uh, how those materials are used and how they perform and so I, I mean it might sound obvious but the tip of the rod has to go through a pretty large bend right and and it has to have some level of durability um, so in general we're going to use a little bit of a lower modulus uh, fiber or a lower modulus uh, composite material up there and then conversely, at the butt of the rod, um, that's our opportunity to use some really stiff fibers um, and potentially like save on some weight and, and really leverage the stiffness qualities of materials. And then everywhere in between, there's an opportunity to, to optimize some combination of those two different ends of the rod. Uh, and so designing with a four-piece rod is just awesome. And in some ways, it just allows us to do more than we could with a two-piece rod. Well, that makes sense. And I, I would ask you on that subject, you know, in, in saltwater especially, uh, and for anglers that really don't ever have to travel or just kind of keep their rods in their skiff and mm -hmm. don't ever go near an airport to uh, to destination fish, there's the one-piece rod following. And that, yeah. you know, that's still out there today. I mean, there seems to be kind of like this cult that loves the one-piece. Is that, I mean, is that a, a true advantage just because there's, you know, fewer potential weak points on the rod, or is it more of kind of a novelty? What do you think? Yeah, we recently came out with a limited edition one-piece rod. Just, it was an 11 weight for tarpon fishing. We made 150 of them. Uh, and that was kind of a, a tester to see, you know, how designing a one-piece rod would go, how shipping a one-piece rod would go, all those different things. Um, and so to me, the true advantage of a one-piece rod is um, if you're fighting a big fish like a tarpon uh, to a boat, you you basically have to pull the leader into the rod tip, which means you've got like big chunky knots running up and down through your guides. And I think some of the breakage that happens um, on rods when fighting big fish is 
those sections get pulled apart like ever so slightly. It might be like an eighth of an inch or whatever that is, but it's just enough to cause a stress concentration between those two parts and then something goes, right? And so that one piece rod, it just physically can't separate. Uh, and so you probably don't see those failures. Definitely not carrying those rods on for uh, any kind of travel, though. <laughs> That's uh, No, no, yeah. definitely not. Yeah, it's great if you, you know, are a static angler, and, you, and again, you keep the rods in the boat. And, and yeah, it's got you need a home for your one-piece rods. Yeah, not traveling with it. Well, how do rod guides? So you, you've built a blank, you've got all that dialed in, and then you go about, you know, building the actual rod, where you're adding, you know, the grip and, and, and the tip-top and all the guides. How do rod guides in their placement along that, you know, call it nine foot uh, blank, affect the line's movement during a cast? And in turn, does this, this placement affect the overall performance of the rod? You know, the number of stripping guides or how far apart they are, how much of a factor is that? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's the, the dynamic qualities um, of the line, like flying through the guides at, uh, and how that line bends uh, with the blank, like when the rod's loaded up fighting a fish. But what really comes to mind for me is, um, like, I can use guide sizes and guide placement down the length of the blank to really fine-tune an action. It's It can be kind of like um, one of the last little design bits is like, oh, this, this blank feels great, and then let's, like, tune the guides a little bit. Uh, and so, yeah, guide weight is huge. I think guides have, in general, gotten lighter over time, and that's... Uh, aided in making rods feel really lightweight and responsive. Sometimes, in some cases, uh, a heavier guide can help load up the rod. And so uh, that can actually be like an advantage. You know, if you're if you want to load up a rod without a lot of line outside the rod tip, like think about a saltwater application uh, that the guide and the weight that's going on there can actually help the cause a little bit. That makes sense. Well, you, you touched on this a few minutes ago, but uh, going back to like the R8 series of rods, you've got the freshwater R8s, and then you've got a specific kind of saltwater series. And the big difference there is is the composites, the materials you use just to make those rods stronger, correct? Well, it, yeah, so it's the materials. They use um, there's similar materials between those two rods, but it's the application of those two materials and and the underlying design that, that uh, brings out some of the differences. Um, and so, for example, with the saltwater rods, um, and, and this is something that Sage has had over the years, is our saltwater rods are significantly stronger than the freshwater rods down the whole length of the rod. And so it's going back to that idea of when you're going to Belize or the Bahamas or what have you, you want a rod that's you know going to have that level of durability that will get you through the trip. Uh, so there's that element. And then some of the application of how the materials are used um, you know, in, um, just in the design for like fighting a fish and, and all of that. Um, that's some of my, the fun part of my job is figuring out how to best use the materials for an application. Well, there have obviously been so many advancements, especially over the last 10, 20 years in, in rod technology and materials. Um, and, and obviously the, the needle has significantly moved as far as performance. And, you know, you could call that, you know, distance, um, fish fighting capabilities, how strong rods are, and, and conversely, how um, it's getting more difficult to, to break a, a well-built saltwater rod. Like, so mm. much thought has gone into this. But at this point, I mean, do you think we're bumping up against the glass ceiling when it comes to, you know, composites and materials and technologies? Is, you know, if we kind of made rods, like, they're at the top, it, it can't get any better than it is, or you know, can we still expect some really big revolutionary advances with rod design in the years to come? Yeah, I, well, I get really excited about the nuances, and to me, there's like a a world of opportunity out there our, for our small team uh, developing rods at Sage. Uh, we're surveying the field, trying to uh, you know account for all the opportunities out there, and it's like we need to be really thoughtful about which ones we're spending our time on because like. We could just get like scattered. We, I mean, we all get so excited. So, yeah, I think uh, there's just opportunity abound out there. We're, we're nowhere close to that glass ceiling yet. Uh, I don't think so. Nice. No. Well, that's good to hear. I know uh, for gear junkies, that's what gets them excited yeah. for yeah. sure. Well, let me ask you as a rod designer and a rod builder, yeah. 
What's the most difficult line weight to consistently produce? Is there one line weight that's like, oh, this is just, this is always the tricky one or kind of your least favorite personally? Oh, least favorite. Um, it's, it's like asking you which one of your children you like the least. I well, get it. Yeah. I know. I just, <laughs> I, I honestly, I have fun with all the line weights. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't know that one's harder than the other. I think uh, sometimes uh, like an all around type of rod that has to do a wide variety of things can be the most challenging because if there's a rod with a specific application and I can say, uh, here's the fly you would use with this rod, here's the line you would use this with this rod, like that's a pretty easy set of factors. It's kind of constant over time or there's less variation. But when you start to factor in like this rod, I want to throw a size 20 midge or whatever. And then also this rod is going to throw like a three and a half inch sculpin or whatever. I think that's um, what, probably the most challenging type of a project. But it's not like a, you know, a five weight is easy to manufacture and a seven weight is really difficult or, you know, an 11, you know, is, is so much more trickier to maintain that consistency in production. They're kind of all about the same. Yeah, I think they're all about the same. Sometimes the the really light line weights can can be a challenge just because uh, they're like on really shallow tapers um, and, and they have really small diameters. And so sometimes um, actually getting a, a, the sections to fit together is like um, one of the bigger design constraints, in my opinion. Uh, and so it it this is like behind the scenes, right? But um, yeah, sometimes the little the little rods are can be tough to um, to to get where you want them to be. That makes sense. Well, you know, we talked about the strength of rods. Obviously, uh, we've touched on that a bunch. But the rea- reality is that you know rods break. I mean, it happens. Waders leak. You know, fly lines snap. You know, and rods break. It's just yeah. part of of the game, and especially when we're you know getting out and traveling. But uh, you know, I, I think the reality is that a lot of the high end rod companies are no longer just focused on the manufacturing business. They're also in the repair business, and that has mm. to be a pretty big component of how you guys operate. I mean, you deal with rods coming back, and not saying that you know Sage Rods rods break uh, you know more than any other rod probably less um but you are dealing with that kind of constant rod repair process um and nowadays pretty much all of the premium rod companies have that lifetime warranty right yeah that's got to be challenging yeah it is i you know part of what you get with that um repair policy and our support of our product is we have to inventory materials and tooling and parts from years and years ago right and so uh i've always thought it's really cool that if you send in an older sage rod uh you're going to get that same rod back uh a lot of people have like you know sentimental value with a rod and 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 besides that they may be very comfortable with the performance of the rod and and that's you know that's what they want rather than like some newer replacement uh and so yeah i've always enjoyed that part of sage uh we've got a whole team that you know, just fix, fixes rods, um, and works with the older stuff. Uh, and so it kind of goes back to our heritage and, and why we're, you know, crafting fly rods 40, 45 years later. Well, I, I would venture to guess that most of the time anglers are not breaking rods, actually fighting fish. I mean, that, that can happen, but there's so many other ways that rod rods break. What do you see as the most common reasons when when rods come back in for repair that a rod has been broken are are these you know dumb mistakes that can be avoided what what do you see as kind of a pattern on broken rods yeah i think um you see a lot of rods i mean god the vast majority of rods are broken in the tip section right and that just kind of tells you that something happened out there right um and so a couple things aside from like the car door the ceiling fan those ones are obvious right but um two things come to mind for me. One is uh, hitting your rod tip with your fly. So if you start just that little, uh, you initiate that tiny little fracture, um, composites in general aren't great at um, like arresting that fracture. And and so, yeah, you may be damaging your rod um, in a way that you don't realize when you hit your rod tip with your fly. And then, you know, three months later, the next time you go fishing, then you like bend that 
tip section on a fish and then pop, there it goes. Uh, so that's one uh, cause of failure. And then another one is high sticking a, a fish, right? You kind of do get the candy cane profile on your rod and you just overload that top third, call it, of the rod. Um, and so in general, I think um, I'd recommend that people when they're fighting fish, try to load the rod a little bit lower into the middle or even the butt section of the rod. That's really how you pull on a fish. If you get a little uh, scale of some sort, or even just you can attach a small one or two ounce weight to your line and like try to drag it across the grass, try dragging it with your rod tip straight over your head. You're not going to make much headway, but if you reel down and point that rod tip uh, directly at your little weight and you, you lift with the bottom part of the rod, you can really move some weight. And so, um, yeah, it, it, it pays to know how the rod works best. Well, two things that are interesting. One, um, you know, fighting the fish down into the butt section of the rod. I mean, so applicable, especially if you're going after GT, tarpon, you know, any big animal like that that, you know, is going to give you a fight. Um, there's such a difference between fighting those those big creatures down into the butt of the rod. You can land them so much quicker. I mean, not only is it better for protecting your rod, it's also better for the fish, obviously. And then uh, it, it's interesting that your first point there about, you know, potentially nicking uh, the top of the rod with the fly or, or, or somewhere along the blank, um, that gets right back to casting, which we were talking about at the beginning of the program as far as your practice. Totally. You know, if you can become a better caster, you're going to lessen the likelihood of, of hitting your rod with, with a fly or a piece of split shot or whatever it is you're throwing and, uh, and you know, just make it last longer. So it all gets back to practice. Yeah, totally. I like to practice with a piece of yarn on there um, and or you could like use a fly and cut the hook off. But uh, the yarn doesn't uh, like will not start a crack in your rod. So that's a, you know, hit your rod tip as much as you want with a piece of yarn until you don't do that anymore. And then tie on a big honking heavy fly. So, you know, <laughs> the, the takeaway from that is it's not only all of the guides and lodge owners that want you to practice your casting, the rod manufacturers want you to practice yeah, as well. Right. So yeah. that, that's a big takeaway right there. Well, as a part of uh, Farbank, the parent company, uh, that owns Sage. Sage is also associated with and, and linked to other companies, including Rio and Reddington. You guys are all under that big umbrella. Um, the the Farbank catalog, the product catalog, has has grown substantially over the years. You guys have rods, obviously reels, fly lines, uh, accessories, um, flies under the Rio brand now, uh, all kinds of terminal tackle. You guys offer a ton of different products. Let me ask you, as an angler. What gear introductions or, or new equipment have you seen come out recently over, say, the last few years uh, that you think has been a game changer for the traveling angler? And I'm going to um, not allow you to say anything having to do with fly rods. you got to get okay. creative on this because okay. we've, we've been talking about rods. But what are what's some of the other gear uh, introductions or innovations that you think have made travel and destination angling easier or better for the traveling angler? Yeah, when I think about a destination fishery, one where I like really want to be on my top game, I think about having um, a fresh fly line uh, or, or just a clean fly line uh, and then have it like really greased up really good. And so some of the new fly line coatings are just awesome. Uh, they're super slick. They make it really easy to shoot line out there fast. Um, I think, you know, in saltwater fishing, a, a big thing that separates salt water fishing from a lot of freshwater fishing is the time component so like when you see that fish it's like the clock starts more or less and you've got to get that line out there um, so having a good clean slick line is is critical so line coatings and then also any number of um, applications you know uh, like gels and stuff silicone that you put on the line I think that's huge and I really like some of the sprays that have come out recently in the little squirt bottle. Uh, you can just like hit your line while it's on the reel uh, in the morning or like halfway through the day. I think it helps if you let that stuff like sit on there for a little bit. Maybe hopefully you have a 30 minute run or something so that stuff can soak in and and uh, it just makes life way easier when your line is nice and slick. Yeah, we uh, we're huge proponents of fresh, clean, slick fly lines. You know, you, especially when you travel and you go to great distances, gets back to what you've invested in that trip. 
um, you know, not just the travel costs, but all the gear and whatnot that you've bought. And don't let, uh, you know, a hundred to $150 piece of equipment, your fly line be the, uh, the weak point or the deciding factor is something that detracts from that overall experience. Fly lines are everything, no doubt. Definitely. I think the fly rod is going to behave fairly st- similarly every time you pick it up but the line if it's dirty it's going to behave way differently than if it's brand new out of the box no doubt well peter this has been great thanks so much for uh sitting down with us and talking rod design and uh and sharing your your wisdom and background with us uh great conversation thanks so much for being here yeah you bet it was fun jim thank you Well, that is it for this latest episode of Waypoints, the podcast that is 100% dedicated to travel, destination angling, and the search for adventure. Be sure to visit yellowdogflyfishing.com to plan and research travel, source gear, equipment, and flies for your next destination, and stay up to date on the latest angling news and developments. Join us for our next episode, and always remember that wherever you find yourself or wherever this sport takes you, no one ever regretted a life of adventure. This has been another episode of Waypoints, the podcast of fly fishing travel and adventure angling. Waypoints is produced by Brian Gregson with music provided by the Steep Canyon Rangers. Visit yellowdogflyfishing.com for more destination profiles, travel news, and expert advice, and be sure to join us for our next episode.